Sunday of Ordinary Time, and we're just about to begin Mass with our opening hymn, Be Thou My Vision, which is number 394 in the Breaking Bread Missal. Be Thou My Vision, number 394. So just open it up and don't start singing yet, because we have something wonderful to celebrate. Uh, and we got a welcome Ethan into the church today. And what a wonderful gift. I, I love baptism. Anything more easily than music is made so it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> so uh, once again, I invite you to stand as we welcome Ethan into this family.
truth to those who go astray, so that they may return to the right path. Give all who for faith for the faith they profess are accounted Christians the grace to reject whatever is contrary to the name of Jesus and describe them in all that does not happen. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
to the Colossians. Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he himself might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things for him, making peace by the blood of his cross, through him, whether those on earth or those in heaven. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
background in the geography of what was happening in this place. Jericho. Jericho was a vibrant oasis right in the middle of the worst of deserts. 850 feet below sea level, right next to the Dead Sea, the lowest place on earth. There lies Jericho. And it was a playground for kings like Julius Caesar and Augustus, and so many of the Roman kings liked to play there. Um, it was filled with freshwater springs, and they had great agriculture, and this, this lovely large oasis made it possible for people to travel from all through Africa and the South into the Middle East because they had a place to stop and refuel. And Jericho, as lovely and beautiful it was, it was, was down way at the base from Jerusalem. Jerusalem itself is just a very, very high mountain that goes almost straight up. So in a 15-mile walk, if you walk from Jericho to Jerusalem, 15 miles, you have walked from 850 feet below sea level to um, over 2,500 feet above sea level. So you've gone over 3,500 feet, and you've gone through everything from the driest and most arid of climates all the way to cold at the top of Jerusalem, I mean, Chile. Um, so you walk through all of these different climates going up there. And in Jesus' time, there was one road. Um, that road went straight up. And at the base of the road, people used to sit at bank, especially during the Jewish holidays, because uh, the Jews would all have to pass by there. The only way you could get to Jerusalem was on this road. And so as the caravans would pass by, people would be begging, lepers and um, blind people and people with all kinds of illnesses. And this is where Jesus met by the Mass and healed his blindness. And so uh, it was just a, a, a place where uh, all kinds of people gathered looking for help, and then the people would begin their ascent to Jerusalem. Now, few would even bother to go in alone. They were always went in caravans and in groups, and there was a good reason for that. One is that in the best of circumstances, it was a treacherous pass. It was mountainous, it was straight up, and like when you're walking straight up and the limestone gets dry, it crumbles and you start to fall. You need people to be there to catch you. Um, it's um, it's got, got, um, just a million things in rainstorms. It's extremely difficult. But most difficult of all is the fact that it was a setup for robbers. It was perfect. It was just like the old west where they, you see them as they're coming around the pass or where you're waiting to get the train when it comes right through here and you know it's the only way it can come through. And the robbers love an ambush. And so the ambushes were always, always ready. So consequently, they called it the road of blood for two reasons. The road of blood because of how much blood was shed there over and over and over again. But also, it also, the rocks had a red color as you get towards the Mount of Olives, and then you go up the Mount of Olives down and then up the rest of the way to Jerusalem. So it's, a, it's just a fascinating road, and it's built right, it's kind of like the Great Wall of China. It's built right on the crest of the hill, so that all there is for you to do is go down from there. So anybody can knock you on the head and throw you down, you just roll forever and ever, like the cars in all those crazy movies where somebody gets rolled down the hill. <laughs> That's the way it works. So it was on this road that Jesus was talking about, but he's talking about what yet they coming from Jerusalem back. So he says, um, these people were in Jerusalem, and, but he said there was a man who was going on his way to Jerusalem that was fell among robbers. And he was beaten, he was laying half dead by the side of the road, and it says the other people were coming down from Jerusalem. Now first comes the priest. And he's coming down from Jerusalem, minding his business, and um, um, he uh, looks over and he sees this man. And this man, I'm sure the priest had in his heart a certain sense of pity. I'm sure he had a thought that somebody should do something about this. But I'm also sure that he asked the wrong question. Because the question he asked was, what will happen to me if I help him? What will happen to me if I help this poor, beaten soul? Is he thinking, 
Is he going to jump up and beat me and leave me like that and take all of my stuff? Is he one of those robbers in disguise? Or are the robbers that did this to him still waiting? So all they are waiting for is somebody to stop along the way and they will come and get him. And so he says, guess what? I'll pray for him. And he walks on the other side of the road. Um, unable to act because of the risk, unable to act because of what will happen to me. And the Levite, likewise, is walking along, also a man of God. He walks along, once again, asks the same question. What will happen to me if I take a chance on helping this man? And how frightening it must have been. You know, I mean, I'm sure in many ways he saw his life pass behind before his eyes. He's thinking, you know, I really should do something. People are looking at me. Not good for public opinion. It's, something should happen here, but I really can't. I'm too afraid because what will happen to me if this guy's faking? What will happen to me if more robbers are in the bush and he walks on the other side? And then the Samaritan. The Samaritan who, um, first of all, in Jerusalem, guaranteed the Jews had all kinds of insults for him, like the Samaritans had for the Jews. When Jesus was going there, just before this in the Bible, yeah, Jesus is going to Jerusalem, and the Samaritan said, just keep moving. And James and John said, shall we call down thunder on him? Jesus said, oh, shut <laughs> so, um, so, the, uh, so they had just been unwelcomed in Samaria. Well, equally, when that Samaritan went to Jerusalem, I'm sure there were all kinds of insults for her for him and all kinds of slurs and all kinds of words had been said. And I'm sure that the guy who fell among robbers would have been throwing out equal insults, equal statements about you're our enemy, you're good for nothing, you're this thing, the other thing. Anyways, the Samaritans walk again, and moved with pity, something in his heart. And when he was moved with pity, instead of asking the question, what will happen to me if I act? He asked the other question, what will happen to him if I don't act? What will happen to this man if I don't do something? And thrown into action by asking the right question, he goes, he tends to the man's wounds, puts him on his own beast, carries him to the inn, tends to his knees, pays for his keep, and tells the innkeeper, if he owes any more, I'll pay the rest of it on my return, because all of his money is stolen. So now, all of a sudden, the tables are turned upside down. The one who is the one that is the brother of all the jokes, the one who is the brother of all the hatred, the one who isn't allowed in our presence or in our meals, all of a sudden is the one who asks the right question and knows what it's really about. That it's about how I love. Not how I love those who love me. Not how I love those who are easy to love. Not how I love my family. How I love those are the hardest to love. My enemies, those who are professed as my enemies. And how do I reach them? And what question do I ask when I see them in need? And so we see this marvelous gift that Jesus holds up as an example. And then, on the other hand, I like to think of what about the man who fell in with robbers? What must he be feeling and thinking? Can you imagine how humbling that would be to be all of a sudden know that your own priests and clergy walk by you, that your own people walk by you, and the enemy who you mistakenly hated comes and picks you up and tends to all of your needs. How incredibly humbling it must be to recognize that God does things not the way we expect them, but the way God surprises us. God is filled with all kinds of surprises. And this man probably cussed out a whole bunch of other people who walked by him. Uh, but you know what? He didn't need to do that because God was the one he needed to turn to in the first place. If you depend on God and who your God sends, and you, your God will send you angels every design of life. And when he sends them, all you have to do is welcome them and let them do what they can do even if you to minister to you today as we
present Ethan for baptism. What a wonderful day it is to present him for baptism because our whole liturgy is about how incredibly simple religion is. It's not about denomination. It's not about Buddhist or Hindu or Muslim or Catholic or Christian. It's not about all of that. Jesus said, what this thing is about, first, foremost, and totally, is love. Anything after that is culture or love. But, but the reality is, is that this love is the basis of it. And Moses said it in the opening reading. In the opening reading, we hold, Moses says, the command that I give you, it's not so extreme that I say, it's so mysterious that you have to find out who will go fly up in the sky and get it, or who will dive way down in the ocean and bring it up to me. You don't have to do all kinds of spinning around and circling around and doing all kinds of other antics to find what God wants. If you want to know what God wants, he says it straight up. Keep the commandments I give you. Very simple. Keep the commandments I give you. And then look to your own heart. He says it is something very near to you. All you have to do is look in your own mouth, in your own heart. What do you tell your children about living and loving? Tell them to be nice, play nice, don't fight, share your toys. Think of how we tell our children over and over again, don't lie, and we do all of those things that we tell them not to do, and we don't even notice that we're doing it. But the reality is, we know it's in our heart. It's in our heart. It's in our heart. And we're challenged to believe that our faith is simple. It's about how we love. How do I choose the person around me? And if I'm in the mood, how do I let them know? And if they're in the how do I reach out and ask the question, what will happen to them if I don't know it? And how do I carry it out? That's what Moses says at the end of the book. He says, all you have to do is carry it out. Jesus said, the one who treated him with mercy is the most loving. He said that, go and do likewise. What a simple, easy command. And so Ethan's in this wonderful stage of life where he can throw up, he can poop his pants, he can spit on you, and we all will love him. <laughs> it won't make any difference, it will just be cute. And that will go away. <laughs> but if he keeps it later, then we're challenged to say, what does he need for us not to condemn him? <laughs> the fact is, is that as Christian community, we are gathered here to say, we choose this child, regardless of everything else, how he is, what he knows, what he learns, what he's ever able to do, we are saying, God loves you today, and God loves you just as you are, and we will always love you as you are. And if you change good if you, to the better, if you don't, well, we still will love you as you are. And at the same time, we're calling him and inviting him to the same. We're inviting him to love us as he finds us to love us. And his life will be filled with incredible surprises, like all of our lives are filled with incredible surprises of people who love us, people who touch us that we've never guessed. People who make the difference. And usually, it's so often, just like in those movies of unrequited love, where a girl's in love with a guy, and he's madly in love with somebody else, and she's the wind beneath his wings, and then all of a sudden, at the end, he recognizes who's really been loving him. You know, the fact is, who has really been loving us all the way? We have only to look as near as our hearts, as near as our lips, carry out this love, and we'll see that he's the God who loves us. That is the God who will always provide everything that we need. We place our prayers before our God, trusting in His mercy.
pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. For our parishioners for whom this Mass is being offered, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray that by the mystery of your death and resurrection, you will bathe this child in light, and you will give her new life of baptism and welcome her to your holy church. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray that through baptism and confirmation, you will make Ethan a faithful follower and a witness to your gospel. And we pray that you will lead him by a joy, by a holy life, to the joys of God's kingdom. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray that you will make the lives of his parents and godparents examples of faith and to inspire him always. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. I ask for your prayers for um, two children that were killed in my grandson's class in Euclid. They were killed in a car accident, uh, Alex and Deja. We pray that the Lord will bring them to eternity and console their families and their friends. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And now we look to the saints in, the, in our Blessed Mother and Heavenly Host. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Saint Joseph. Pray for, pray for us. St. John the Baptist. Pray for us. St. Peter and St. Paul. Pray for us. St. Anthony. Pray, pray for us. St. Peter. Pray for us. St. Cecilia. Pray for us. St. Ethan. Pray for us. And all you saints of God. Pray for us. And now we bless the waters of the fountain. Praise you, Almighty God, the Father, for you have created water to cleanse and give life, and we respond to blessed be God. Blessed be God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, the Father's only Son, for you offered yourself on the cross in the blood and water flowing from your side, and through your death and resurrection the church was born. Blessed be God. Praise to you, God, the Holy Spirit, for you anointed Jesus at his baptism in the waters of the Jordan, so that we all might baptized in you. Bless us. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you have called Ethan to this cleansing water, that he may share in the faith of your church, and that he may have eternal life. By the mystery of this water, lead him to a new and spiritual birth. We ask this through Christ, our Lord. Amen. In our baptisms, we professed our faith, and we, as we professed our faith, we knew that we were making a, a, we were making a, a commitment and those who professed it for us made that commitment for us. And so today, as we renew the vows of our own baptism, once again we're challenged to profess our faith and to reject what is evil and to choose what is good. Parents, Godparents, Christian communities, we have been called, we have called this child for baptism. The water, by watering the Holy Spirit, he will receive a gift of new life from our God this life. If our faith makes us ready to accept this responsibility, let's renew the vows of our own baptisms. Let's reject sin, profess our faith in Christ Jesus, the faith of our church, the faith in which Ethan is about to be baptized. And so I ask you that he rejects Satan and all of his works. I do. To reject sin so as to live in the freedom of God's children. I do. To reject the glamour of evil and refuse to be masked by sin. I do. God, the Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, died, and was buried, who rose from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of God? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting? I do. This is our faith. This is the faith of our church. We're proud to profess it. Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So I invite Gary and Nat to bring up Ethan and the godparents and any of the family members to come up. Ethan? Even though you're sleeping, baptize <laughs> in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thank <laughs> you. 
faith in a job today. We're going to ask him to, he's going to do like Jesus, and he's going to have a, a priestly role, that he'll be somebody who sees the specialness of life, that he'll be somebody who is loving and working in God's kingdom. And we do that with this oil, and it's called prism. It smells really nice. And prism is uh, used for like priests, prophets, kings, and we use it for confirmation. And it points out that he has a special place, a special role that only he can fulfill in Christ's kingdom. I anoint you with the prism of salvation, as Jesus was anointed with priest, prophet, and king. So we live as a member of his body, sharing everlasting life. Before I give the lecture, I have to say, now we thank you for the light you put back in your eyes. How wonderful they found each other in this beautiful gift of love. And we are so grateful. Receive this gift of light from Christ. Parents, godparents, Christian community, this light is left to be is entrusted to us to be kept burning brighter. As even as it enlightened as a child of the light, so may we go out in faith to meet Jesus with all the saints in the heavenly kingdom. The Lord Jesus made the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. May you soon touch your ears to hear his word and your lips to proclaim his name to the glory of God.
seasons obey your laws. But you chose to create us in your own image and set us over the whole world in all its splendor. You made us the stewards of creation to praise you day by day for the marvels of your wisdom and power. And so we do praise you, Lord, with all the angels and saints in one unending praise. Protect us 
festival on Ang Sain as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. For the power and glory Lord Jesus, you said your apostles, I leave you peace for the Sunday of the Lord our sins, forget the state of your church, bring us the peace and the unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord with you all.
Thank you. 